Welcome all of you to this live program, Dr. Theory Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Wolf Peterson from Berlin, Germany. Professor Peterson is the Director of Orthopedic Department, Martin Luther Hospital, Berlin, the Academy Hospital of Charity. He specializes in sports trauma, osteotomy, and arthroplasty, and certified by the German Knee Society. He's a past president of the German Knee Society and the vice president of the German Sports Trauma Society, and also serves as board member. He's also chief editor of the Knee Journal and serves on the editorial board for operative orthopedics and trauma, and also uh, the arthroscopy, the Journal of the Ega. He has been the chairman of the 10th Berlin Osteotomy course for 2023 and also been the chairman of the 13th German Arthroscopy course for 2023. He has published widely and has more than 400 PubMed indexed publications to his credit. If you notice, Professor Peterson has delivered a couple of lectures on our channel and already reached a huge audience. And today is my great honor to bring back Professor Wolf Peterson for this wonderful live program. Oh, dear Professor. Yeah, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Uh, it's a big pleasure um, yeah, to talk today about failed ACL reconstruction, failure analysis and uh, revision. And this is definitely my last presentation of the year. So I'm looking forward to, to this presentation. Um, yeah, um, if you have your mobile um, device, you can um, take your mobile device during my presentation. And uh, because I have several QR codes in uh, in this presentation uh, where you can get uh, access to, to videos or maybe original uh, articles uh, and papers. And here are some codes uh, to my social media activities, such as uh, my Instagram account or the account of uh, the International Knee Academy. Okay, um, yeah, let's start uh, to talk about ACL revision. Um, and uh, there was uh, one important paper coming out, I think uh, this year it was an uh, expert uh, consensus, uh, consensus um, pro process um, about the management of the uh, of anterior cruciate ligament re re revision in adults. And um, this uh, expert group tried to define indications uh, for ACL revision. And um, when you see the result, you see that the, um, the indication for ACL revision is very wide. So um, all patients uh, with failed ACL reconstruction with instability symptoms, age below 50 year and uh, indication is seen regardless of sportive activity or a sports activity level meniscal status and ao grade but when we before when we talk about the technique of revision or how we how we operate our patients uh, we have to to check why this acl reconstruction has has failed and Failing to plan is planning to fail. Uh, this is a um, quote of Benjamin Franklin. And this is absolutely true for ACL revision surgery. So we have to perform a, a failure analysis and you can uh, see this checklist. We have to check for slope. We have to check for double virus. We have to check for peripheral instabilities because all these um, um, um factors uh, could be uh, factors which are responsible for uh, for failure of acl reconstruction but we should also look for 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 example for metal implants we have to look for the tunnel position of our previous tunnels and we have to look for tunnel widening and we have to consider which graphs are available and when we have considered all these factors and uh, um, according to our checklist, then we can decide, can we go for one stage revision or should we go for a two stage procedure? Now let's talk about these, uh, all these factors. Failure analysis, slope, tibial slope is a very um, uh, important topic. Um, and it has become popular, pop very popular during the last uh, few years. Um, because we have seen that an, an increased tibial slope results in increased anterior tibial translation and uh, which puts increased stress on the ACL, which you can see here on the schematic drawing. And this increased stress due to the um, steep tibial slope yeah, can cause failure 
either of the ACL, but also of, of your ACL reconstruction. And um, this is a landmark study uh, by Webb. It's an Australian uh, working group. And um, these authors found that a posterior tibial slope of more um, than 12 degrees increases the risk for re rupture after ACL reconstruction by um, 59%. Therefore, this tibial slope of, of more than 12 degrees is uh, today is uh, considered as an indication criterion uh, to perform a correction of the tibial slope before um, we uh, do a, a, a new ACL uh, revision. Um, technique of uh, posterior tibial slope, you can see it here in the in the schematic drawing there. Several techniques published. Um, um, one technique is with detachment of the tibial tuberosity. Uh, and then uh, you do the, the osteotomy at the level of the tibial tuberosity. Um, I prefer this subtuberosity or this tuberosity sparing technique where you uh, start your osteotomy below uh, the most uh, inferior fibers of the, of the patella tendon. And then you take a wedge out of approximately five, uh, six millimeters, um, and then you uh, close the gap, and uh, then we stabilize um, um, the osteotomy with one uh, leg screw on the lateral side and a, a angular stable plate on the on the medial side. Here, you can scan these QR codes to to get to the uh, PDF of this uh, technique we published it in arthroscopy techniques and you can also get access to the video which is also um, published on uh, on this platform um yeah the next um, point is we we should not only be, uh, look to the tibial slope um, we forgot the coronal plane a little bit uh, during the last years but when you look to this patient he was referred to me to do a primary ACL reconstruction um, but you can see what happens when uh, when he loads uh, his knee. Um, you see, you can see a wide opening of the lateral uh, joint space, and you can see it even here in in, uh, in the um, long-standing um, X-ray. And when you perform ACL reconstruction in uh, such a patient, uh, you will get an overload um, of your. ACL reconstruction because the white beam line is here on the medial side, which causes stress to the um, ligaments on the lateral side. Um, if you have a lateral laxity, then this stress is transferred to your ACL um, reconstruction or your, uh, your your or your primary ACL. Um, therefore, um, I recommend if you have an, uh, a mechanical access or various deformity of more than five degrees and additionally uh, a, a, an, an increased lateral joint line uh, conversion angle, um, yeah, then you should think about uh, to correct um, the, the various deformity yeah, to prevent um, high stress on your, on your ACL reconstruction. So this increased joint line conversion angle is a, is a very strong indication criterion to perform a um, uh, high TBL osteotomy. If you're interested in the technique, uh, you can scan this uh, QR code and uh, uh, with this QR code, you get access to the surgical technique of high TBL osteotomy. <clears throat> yeah, then associated ligamentous instabilities. We have to look to the medial side, to intermedial instabilities, medial and posteromedial instabilities, but also to the anterolateral side and uh, uh, anterolateral and posterolateral and uh, posterior. I can show you one example why this can be important. Um, here you can see a patient um, who came to us uh, with a recurrent instability after ACL reconstruction eight years ago. Um, yeah, she was not uh, not happy uh, with this uh, result. You can see here the the tunnel for the ACL. And this is, uh, is okay, um, but the problem is you can see this is a posterior stress X-ray. She has a posterior um, instability because here is a post increased posterior tibial translation of about um, eleven millimeters, and um, this is obviously a patient with a, a neglected. PCL and postural injury, and if you perform ACL reconstruction in, in such a patient, um, you uh, 
pull the tibia into a post fixed posterior um, subluxation. And when you have this condition, you have when you or when you would like to manage uh, um, this this condition, you have to resect the ACL. Then you have to treat the fixed posterior drawer with a PTS brace. And when uh, the fixed posterior uh, subluxation has uh, is is normalized, then you can go for an ACL and uh, and, and and the PCL reconstruction. And, and that's why it's so important uh, yeah, to to make always an adequate um, diagnosis. Yeah, this is a bicruciate reconstruction plus posolateral reconstruction in in this uh, patient. The next um, peripheral instability I would like to talk about is the lateral rotational uh, or anterolateral um, in uh, instability or anterolateral injury, which is. Uh, quite uh, frequent uh, associated with uh, ACL injury. So the incidence or prevalence um, ranges from 10 to, to 60%. And um, many working groups have shown that um, that the failure rate of ACL reconstruction is, is definitely uh, lower when you combine it with ALL reconstruction. Therefore, um, ACL revision is seen as one indication uh, to perform an anterolateral lateral procedure um, so therefore we uh, or i in my in my clinical practice i um, combine nearly all my revision acl revision surgeries with an anterolateral procedure so we have two main anterolateral techniques um, one technique is the anterolateral reconstruction with the free gracilis grafts it was um um, um published by uh, Bertrand Sonoricoté. And the other is the old uh, anterolateral latinodesis with a tractor stripe, uh, which was originally published by Le Maire. Uh, I prefer the Le Maire uh, tenodesis. Uh, one factor is the graft choice because it's uh, uh, it's easy to harvest and it's at the uh, uh, iliotibial tract. But uh, in the Hauk and, and Amos, they have shown that in a knee with a with combined ACL and anterolateral ligament injuries, the modified Lemaire tenodesis combined with ACL reconstruction restored normal laxities at all angles of flexion, whereas the LL reconstruction restored intact in the kinematics only in full extension. Therefore, um, this anterolateral uh, Lemaire tenodesis is my preferred technique. Um, yeah, to to address the anterolateral structures, you can see here the a schematic drawing of the of the surgical technique. Uh, you first you mobilize the stripe, an approximately eight or ten millimeter wide stripe from the tractors, from the iliotibial tract. Um, the length should be between ten and eleven millimeters. Um, then you uh, pull it below the end, the lateral collateral ligament and, and fix it with an interference screw. You can see um, some photos of the surgical technique. We harvest the, um, the tendon stripe with a double blade. Here you can see the stripes, which is uh, reinforced by a, a, an absorbable suture. Then it's pulled below the ACL and then fixated um, with an interference screw. And the tunnel is here. Um, below uh, or, or behind the lateral epicondyle, and you should make sure that your um, that the chi or K wire or the um, uh, or the or the tunnel goes steep um, upwards to avoid any conflicts with your uh, with your ACL tunnel. The next uh, problem are um, metal implants uh, from previous surgery. If you have metal implants, you should always. Um, think about removal, uh, implant removal before your definitely uh, the, you, before your ACL revision surgery because implant removal can be challenging, especially if you have uh, some tibial cramps or implants uh, like this, uh, which can be covered by by bone. So implant removal can be very challenging. So if you have metal implants. Um, which um, distort your your surgical procedure, then I always recommend to to perform an implant removal before your uh, definitely definite surgery. 
Yeah. Then preoperative planning includes also uh, tunnel management. One factor is tunnel position. Um, or tunnel position, we um, always perform uh, CT scans, um, <clears throat> and because only with the three D reconstruction you can um, estimate the, the real um, um, tunnel position here at the femoral side because uh, of uh, this curved. Uh, surface of the intercondylar notch um, and um, yeah to um, um, to uh, you have um, some landmarks um, to um, fi um, find out where your normal ACL uh, insertion is so one landmark is the intercondylar line which is this line here and the dotted line here is the bone cartilage border and uh, the um, at the point uh, where where those lines meet um yeah there's your acl recons uh, or the, your acl uh, insertion um yeah we described this uh, in this anatomical paper in 2005 already and you can download this paper and here in this uh, yeah in this anatomical um specimen you can see here the intercondylar line and um, the bone cartilage ball and in the most posterior aspect here um, of, of your femoral condyle or of, of, of the cartilage of the femoral condyle, yeah, there is the AM bundle um, of uh, your ACL. And um, according um, to this, um, these landmarks, we divide or we classify the tunnel positions in ACL reconstruction in non-anatomic, partial anatomic, and anatomic. And you can have always uh, yeah, to, to see um, the femoral side and the tibial side, yeah, because I mean, if if it's wrong at the tibial side, um, and correct at the femoral side, yeah, then you you have to perform a tunnel filling. If um, if you have a complete um, non anatomic um, reconstruction, you can go for a single stage revision, and if you have an anatomic reconstruction, you can also consider single stage revision. But when you you have a partial anatomic um, position, these are the problematic uh, tunnel positions, then you should consider a two-stage uh, um, revision. One factor you will also have to um, address is, is the tunnel widening, because uh, when you have uh, uh, a non-anatomic tunnel position and with excessive tunnel widening, then this could also be an indication uh, for a primary, uh, for, for a two-stage revision. Here are two examples. Uh, this is an anterior tibial tunnel, this is a posterior or partial anatomic tibial tunnel, but, but with uh, excessive uh, tunnel widening. Um, and in both cases, uh, you can see that you create a very big um, new tunnel when you uh, drill uh, your new tunnel. Therefore, in both cases, I would recommend to perform uh, a tunnel filling with uh, autologous or, or um, allogeneic bone um, before you perform um, your ACL revision reconstruction. So this is our classification. Uh, we classify uh, our tunnel position in, uh, in three groups, anatomic, partial anatomic, and non-anatomic. And then we have to address if there's tunnel widening, which is um, a diameter of more than 11 millimeters or if you have no tunnel widening and in most cases of tunnel widening we have to do a two-stage uh, revision but when we have no tunnel widening in an anatomic tunnel or non-anatomic tunnel then, then we can go uh, for primary revision i will show you um, some examples uh, in a few minutes so First, let's talk about two-stage uh, procedure. Then we um, we start with the first surgical procedure to um, to address the bone tunnels. Uh, first, we uh, I remove the the graft. Then I debride the tunnel wall uh, either with a sharp spoon or, or with a um, acromionizer um, until all graft material is resected and until the bone uh, bleeds. And um, then you can fill um, the tunnel with either with autologous or allogeneic bone. Um, 
to die today i prefer the allergenic bone chips because um of because um, bone chip har chips harvest or bone harvesting is quite time consuming you have the risk of uh, of nerve injuries and um, you also have some uh, donor cell morbidity and so that's why my preferred technique is uh, allergenic bone chips um, we have these uh, applicators um, which can be introduced via your um, arthroscopic uh, portals and um, with these um, applicators you can press uh, the bone chips uh, very nicely into your femur tunnel or into your uh, tibial tunnel. Yeah, so this is these are some arthroscopic slides here of the uh, of the tibial tunnel. You can see here how the tunnel is filled uh, with these bone chips. And then we wait for some months, and uh, the clinical experience has shown that after six uh, three to six months, uh, the bone is hard enough to perform a, a new ACL reconstruction. And in most cases, we perform a, a CT scan to control. Um, the, the filling um, of the tunnel. Then the next point is graft selection or graft choice. Um, we yeah we use all for ACL revision. We we use all the autologous grafts uh, which are available, which are hamstrings, patella tendon, quadriceps tendon, or even peroneus longus uh, grafts. So we that, so. It, and then you can go to the to also to the contralateral uh, side. That that means that we have five to six uh, graft options for our patients, and we have to ask ourselves which grafts have been already used, and maybe do I need bone blocks uh, to augment the defects. Another question is maybe are there associated medial instabilities? And I would go uh, more for an extensor uh, mechanism graft, such a patellar tendon and the, or the quadriceps tendon. Um, yeah, these are um, the factors uh, determine, uh, determining um, which graph we, we use. So we, we performed a study. Um, a colleague of mine performed a study about ACL um, revision surgery. And in this study, we compared uh, semitendinosus with uh, bone uh, quadriceps tendon grafts. And in this study, we found, found no difference uh, in uh, passive stability measured with the KT-1000 or in uh, the Lysolm score. Uh, but there was less donor site morbidity in the quadriceps group. Therefore, uh, the, our conclusion is um, bone quadriceps tendon is a very good grass option for ICL revision surgery. And since, uh, since the hamstring tendons are the most popular grafts, uh, for primary ACL reconstruction here in Germany, um, the quadriceps tendon is um, yeah, the most um, uh, most frequently used graph for uh, ACL revision. I will show you here two cases. This is a 24 years old professional soccer player. Um, he has an anatomical femoral tunnel position. You can see here the tunnel, the old tunnel from the medial portal. Then I prepare the tunnel. Um, I'm sorry. I like to use um to for the final um, um tunnel preparation. I I I like to use uh, dilators because with these dilators you get a very precise um and, and a very um hard tunnel wall, which is uh, important for my fixation method because I perform a press fit fixation when I do this uh, quadriceps um or when I when I use this quadriceps tendon bone graft here. You can see the bone block. Um, into the joint and then I hammer or press um, this this tunnel into into uh, this, this, this bone block into the tunnel and um, this press fit fixation is a very uh, um, reliable uh, fixation technique. Um, another case, soccer, also soccer uh, player, but a female soccer player, paid semitendinous tendon graft. Here you can see an extra anatomic um, tunnel position and uh, in this case we also performed a primary uh, ACL revision um, here you can see the old tunnel it's definitely an extra anatomic tunnel here's the intercondylar line the bone cartilage border and here we should place our our new tunnel um, 
but when uh, you look uh, yeah, to this tunnel position, the the bone bridge is expected to be very tiny and fragile. Um, therefore, in this case, uh, uh, I debrided also um, the, the old uh, tunnel. Then I stabilized um, the old tunnel with an interference screw, and then um, we drilled uh, the new tunnel uh, below um, the old tunnel. I also used the dilators. Um, here you can see the bone block into the joint, and uh, here the uh, fixation of the graft with the uh, with the pressure face technique at the femoral side, and on the tibial side we use an interference screw and um, an additional button. The next. Um, thing we have to talk about is um, the meniscus, especially the ramp lesions, which are quite frequent in ACL revision cases. Uh, in, in my um, personal experience, and to diagnose these ramp lesions, we have always performed the trans notch view. We have to um, um, introduce um, the arthroscope um, in between the, the medial femoral condyle and the PCL into the posthumial compartment uh, to see uh, uh, or to diagnose this um, um, ramp lesion, which is an, a lesion here uh, um, or a separation from the menisco, of the meniscus from the menisco capsula and menisco tibial uh, ligament. And if we diagnose such a lesion, then we uh, can perform an all inside suture hook repair um, from the poster, poster medial portal. If you would like to see a video of this technique, you can scan this code here. Um, and um, so we, we take a suture hook, penetrate um, the capsular uh, side and then um, the meniscus. Uh, and then the suture hook releases uh, the, the suture. And um, with a clamp, you um, uh, can take the suture out uh, of the joint, and then you have to perform a sliding knot uh, and uh, push the sliding knot uh, down, cut the sliding knot, and you can see here the well-fixed um, ramp lesion here from the posterior medial portal. See one suture here, one suture here. And yeah, this is a quite nice uh, technique or reliable technique to uh, treat uh, those ramp lesions. So, yeah. Um, now we we finished our checklist. So we have to perform this failure analysis. Slope. We have to check for slope, double virus, peripheral instability, metal implants, tunnel position, tunnel widening, and we have to check which graphs are available. And um, finally, yeah, we can. Um, Conclude, um, yeah, with uh, or, or, or can draw our conclusion with this algorithm. One very important diagnostic uh, tool is a 3D CT scan. We have to check if we have partial anatomic tunnels or tunnel widening, because in in both cases we should consider tunnel filling with uh, with the bone grafts, and we should also check on the 3D CT scan, but also on our X-rays if we have disruptive implants. And if we have disruptive implants, we should also always consider um, a separate implant uh, removal. But we perform the radiological um, examinations also um, to check if we have a double virus situation, osseous virus and ligamentous virus, more than five degrees. And if you have um, this uh, increased joint line conversion angle. We have also checked to uh, if we have an increased posterior tibial slope of more than uh, 12 degrees. And if both uh, factors are positive, we should consider to perform an osteotomy. And in my clinical practice, I um, mostly combine the osteotomy uh, with tunnel filling uh, with the bone graft. And the next uh, big complex uh, is, is the instability diagnostics, which includes stress X-rays, stress X-rays for, for the peripheral ligaments, but also for the posterior cruciate ligament. And if we have um, uh, posterior tibial translation of more than 10 millimeters, yeah, we, we should consider um, 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 or there's, there's a high chance uh, of an associated PCL injury. And if we have an associated PCL, in PCL injury, 
uh, then we should uh, go for a PCL or bicruciate uh, reconstruction. And if we have um, the diagnosis of a posolateral or posolateral instability, yeah, then we should also address these lesions. But when uh, our tunnel is anatomic and we have no significant tunnel widening, or if we have performed uh, or addressed all these factors, yeah, then we can go um, to uh, per, uh, forward to perform ACL revision, revision surgery, either with the BTB graft, with the bone uh, tendon quadriceps uh, graft, or with the hamstring graft. And uh, in nearly all my revision cases, I combine this uh, surgical procedure with an anterolateral tenodesis uh, plus uh, meniscus repair. Thanks for your audience. And yeah, if you have, uh, if you make your plans for the next year, uh, next year we um, organize the International Knee Days uh, as a uh, face to face meeting in Berlin. And I would be very happy to see you all there. Thanks for the audience. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Prof, you can stop sharing. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for yet another brilliant talk. A lot of pearls and a lot of new insight. Prof, uh, a few questions. Prof, you mentioned that you use allogenic chips, right? And what about, yeah. because uh, it may not be available in different parts of the world, what about using an ilia crest bone, bone block? Yeah. Um, several years ago, uh, and, and, and yeah, you can also take a bone block. Um, but um, I, when I used, um, I used um, graft from the iliac, uh, iliac crest, I also used bone chips uh, because I like uh, to um, to applicate uh, the bone with these applicators and because this is uh, um, surgically um, very uh, comfortable. Well, the bone chips would tend to migrate, isn't it? Do you think bone blocks have an advantage? No. Mm, yes, that's the point. Um, but you um, you have to press it, uh, um, compress it in, in, in the tunnel, um, and then uh, the, the, the chips will stick to the tunnel. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor, also in one of the slides of the different graph sources, I saw you also mentioned peroneus longus. I personally use peroneus longus in some of my cases because I find it very easy to harvest and nice, thick and bulky and even a long graft. So what has been your personal experience with the use of the peroneus longus? I have, I, I personally have not too much experience with the peroneus longus. Um, um, because mostly it, it works with the other grafts. Um, and then um, I like to stay at the knee joint. Okay. Because one of the reasons I felt was it's very quick. And there are a couple of papers that have looked whether there's any yeah. problem with the ankle. And they found that there's no major issue with the ankle because the peroneus brevis is still there. Yeah, you are right. Um, um, I know all these papers and uh, they're good arguments uh, to use the peroneus longus um, graft. But today in Germany, it's not too popular. Popular um, this graft, and um, yeah, therefore, and if there's that, that's why the, if there's no need um, yeah, to to use another graft, then then I like to stay at the knee joint. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor, also you mentioned about the ramp lesion, right? The ramp. So mm -hmm. uh, different ways to repair it. Uh, is it technically possible to do an all inside meniscal repair to get the uh, ramp? Yes, this, this is possible. It depends a little bit on the, you, you mean uh, with, an, with an implant from the anterior, yeah. uh, from implant, the anterior yeah, exactly. border, yeah. The Air Plus, the striker has a striker Air Plus and so many, yeah. all, the, all the companies have a all inside devices. Yeah. Um, that's right. In some ramp lesions, you can do it. It depends a little bit on the location of the ramp lesion. If you have, in my opinion, the real ramp lesion um, where the capsule um, is um, subluxated downwards, um, then you cannot reach um, the capsule with uh, with your device from the anterior part. But in some cases, you have more uh, 
a more a, a vertical tier very at the capsular junction and then the capsular lesion is is not so um so inferior as i've shown you in in my um in my um, arthroscopic um picture um yeah then you can also use an all inside device from the, from the anterior aspect um to penetrate uh, the the torn meniscus fragment and the capsule to and to do the refixation Thank you very much, Prof. Prof, one last question before I end of the session. Prof, you mentioned about bone tunnels, right? Uh, whether the primary surgery, the tunnel was placed anatomically or not. So if the tunnel was non-anatomic, it is easier for the second surgery, right? Mm -hmm. if, if it's really... Anatomic, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if the first surgeon had put it in a non-anatomical position, the second That's surgery would be a bit easier, isn't it? That's perfect. Yeah, I just wanted to convey that message to the audience because someone, I mean, I, I do a lot of uh, primary ACLs and, and I'm seeing a couple of uh, revisions, I mean, ruptures happening, sending from somewhere else. So I, I just discussed with a colleague and he said, this is the crux. If the first surgery is non anatomic, then your surgery is going to be easier. If the first surgery is anatomic, then your surgery is more difficult. Of course, yeah. Uh, thank you, Prof. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you for yet another brilliant presentation. And we really, really look forward for some more lectures from your side in 2024. Thank you very much. Um, and all